clean the carpets on uh, this week. And, um, and then I, you know, the turkey dinner, the Thanksgiving dinner, we had a crowd. We did. It was awesome. It was awesome. <laughs> I think she was just over 51 good too. people. Yeah, it was really nice. It was really a great experience. Um, Alvin and I went up there and helped Danny, and we did, man. Yeah. It was fun. We had to load the U-Haul because I had two pallets of cabinets when they arrived, and they loaded the U-Haul. Because I was cooking. So, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yes, we yeah. have. Okay, speaking of cleaning, I'm free all this week, except in the late afternoon on Tuesday. Bishop is coming on Sunday. I would love to have a crew anytime you want to come. I'll be here to clean, to polish the altar and Anna Christina has, has said that we can polish the piano, and I know how, and polish the altar, polish, and get the candles, new candles in, and just make it look really spiff. Thank you. Thank you. There is a concert Saturday, um, and that's at 5 o'clock, the part of the concert. Anna Christina is going to send you an email about that on tomorrow. Then uh, for the uh, service, the bishop uh, will be here Sunday, and we have a dinner after work. We are selling tickets for the dinner. Um, if you struggle with paying for that dinner, um, I, I understand. You can keep it confidential. Just let me know. We're not going to turn anybody away. Uh, we never do. We're a church for food, but uh, it does help us cover the cost. And Marie, raise your hand. Just see Marie. Okay. What was that? You'll be in the fellowship hall after service. All right, very good. Um, I, we have, Linda uh, has an announcement. We do have a dinner uh, this Wednesday. Let me raise this up for you. It is on. There you go. Okay. So at our our uh, Wednesday uh, turkey dinner, I just want to give you a few facts on the one that we just had. We cooked about 120 pounds of turkey. We served probably 240 people, including Hope Village, uh, Kelly Shelter, their 20 staff, and then probably 80 or 90 folks that came uh, through the doors, and all the helpers. <coughs> and we had so many great helpers, and um, all of those great helpers are invited to come again this way. <laughs> <laughs> and have even more fun. <laughs> My housemate, which is the minister of the First Presbyterian, um, he came home from his time with his family with um, Thanksgiving food, and I told him no. I had no <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, they're going to get turkey soup. It's going to okay. be turkey soup, turkey noodle great. soup, and fruit salad for somebody in the front row. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll see you there. Let's center ourselves for worship. Thank you.
Alpha and Omega, the one who is and was and is to come. We come to worship the one who rules justly. Come to worship Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Bread of heaven, God with us. Good shepherd, the true vine, eternal word, great I am. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace, we come to worship Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is actually in the Christian year, the last Sunday of the year, when we complete it by claiming Christ as King. So let's join in singing. Yes, yeah, you 
your birthday, Faith? Hey. They both have what? Health issues. Health issues. And what are their names? Dennis and Linda Spark. Dennis and Linda Spark. Okay. Yes? Uh, my grandmother has cancer. Oh, she does. Oh, I'm so sorry. Give me her name again. Sarah. Sarah, that's right. Sarah and I have written to each other. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We'll keep her in our I that's tough. Yes. <clears throat> my marine friend, my fellas, has serious health problems. Your marine friend, what is the name? Michael Ellis. Michael Ellis. Anybody that's a marine, I mean, uh, that probably knows him. Mike Ellis. Mike Ellis. Yes, okay. Health problems. Health problems. Yes. The managers are in quarantine with COVID. Oh, are they really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, the managers are in quarantine for COVID. So is my son and his family. Yes. James and I have 38 years. You have 38 years this week. <laughs> if we don't have a 10, let me call you from here. I tell you, when you get to 65, make sure you bring them. <laughs> yes. A friend of mine, Sheree, had a heart attack last week and triple bypass. A friend of mine, Sheree, triple bypass a heart attack. I pray for Sheree. Yes. Okay. All right. We do want to pray as a congregation for the world and for the violence and wars taking place and we could find a better way. Yes. Her husband died. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Are they young? I'm sorry, and her name is Jennifer. Jennifer, yes. Okay, all right. Yes? Um, I have some friends in the community of Rangel and Alaska. There was a landslide. They just took down to three houses. Um, they found one person alive, and their family is still missing. And this is where, Alaska? Rangel, Alaska. Rangel, Alaska. Slide. People have lost homes and damage. Well, let's uh, center ourselves to pray. And um, our response is, uh, we, loving Creator, we come before you with thanksgiving. We come with gratitude and praise. And uh, let, us, let us join in singing.
May your kingdom come to us as in heaven. Christ our Lord, may we know that you are ever present in all of life. You are in the center of power where decisions are made, willing our leaders to find a better way. Yet are we weak in the humble who no one notices? We pray for all who seek justice and desire mercy. For all who desire a better world and a better way. May your kingdom come. Let us all say together, in us as in heaven. <laughs> Lord, give us reverence for all your creation. Fill us with a sense of wonder. Give us the will and wisdom to clean the oceans, to heal the lands, to clear our air, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. Give us a respect for all your creatures. And swim in the waters that soar above us and walk the earth. We are your stewards called to account. May your kingdom come. Let us say, in us as in heaven. As, as in heaven. For our elected officials, whatever their persuasion or affiliation, we pray for them. From the president to the Congress to our mayor, the city council, give them wisdom as they struggle to confront the problems of our day. Give them a deep affection for their community. May your kingdom come. And let us say, in us as in heaven. In, in us, us as in heaven. heaven. King of peace, with your help, we can create a better world for communities and nations that are at war, for innocent lives that are lost and left in ruin, for Palestinians and Israelis, for people in Ukraine and Syria, for those we love, for those we fight against, for you are the king of us all. Show us how to make peace. May your kingdom come in us. And let us say, in us as in heaven. In, in us, us as in heaven. heaven. Bless our homes that they would be places of peace and hospitality. And for those within our circle of care that are heavy upon our hearts, grandparents that struggle with their health, for sons and daughters that struggle to find a better way, we give thanks for babies and babies to come and the joy they bring, the hope. And we pray for those in our communities that have come near the end of their life. We see them into your arms of love and mercy. May your kingdom come. And let us say, in us as in heaven. In us as in heaven. For this congregation, guide us and give us clarity and mission. Give us hope, give us laughter, give us courage. As we do your work in this world. Hear now the prayer that you taught us praying. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our bread for our needs from day to day, and forgive us our offenses as we have forgiven our offenders. And do not let us enter into temptation, but deliver us as people. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The church is, um, well, you know this, we are actually uh, considered a nonprofit, but we're also a business. You notice the lights are on. <laughs> and we're warm here, right? All that requires money, of course. That's just part of the world we live in. It's part of life. And as I said often, you know, Jesus talked about money more than anything else because it's so important. So much good can be done with it other than the kingdom of God. That's what he talked about. 
Our, our pledges have begun really well. To date, our pledges are 115,472 with 41, 41 pledges adding up to that much. Um, going off memory, last year, Lauren tells us, we raised 122,642 well, last year with 103 pledges. So we are on a good trend. Uh, we're going to want to be on that trend where we are self-supporting uh, for our uh, uh, business, our, our operating costs, and to have a Christian educator, to have a, a children's uh, ministry coordinator in, in January. And uh, that is exciting for us. So, there we are. If you got a card, uh, you know, just turn it in. If you need a card, well, you can talk to me. I can always give you a card if you're talking to us. We will make some. Let us pray. Lord, bless these gifts we are to receive, that through them your word would be proclaimed and your good news announced. Amen. Amen.
We have uh, actually two more history moments. We'll do one and two. The last one is two. Um, this is a combined writing of myself and Alice Knox. And uh, thank you, um, Linda, for reading this, this lesson. Christian Social Concerns by Alice G. Knox. Early on, the Methodist Church studied the subject of alcohol that took first place as a social concern because it was a key, key contributing factor to a host of problems, impacting judgment, misuse of alcohol, impaired safe driving, increased domestic violence, disrupted work capabilities, and became an addiction in one out of 10 persons. Excessive drinking interacted with smoking, drug use, gambling, and sexual abuse, all of which can harm and cost money that could have helped families or the community. First United Methodist Church has sponsored various AA groups throughout history and is currently uh, supporting a women's group that meets on Wednesday at noon. For many years, the church aided people who asked for food, gas, or motel stay. By the 1960s, participating churches coordinated assistance. This congregation participated in the SERVES program, food bank, and Salvation Army shelter. Church members harvested donations from restaurants and donated food and money. That the lay leader reported 28 local outreach, outreach programs in 1987, and in 1988 mentioned that members were driving cancer patients for treatment, providing rides for seniors for medical appointments, giving 24-hour caregivers a few hours of weekly respite, serving as Red Cross volunteers and hospital auxiliary volunteers, delivering meals on wheels, helping the loaves and fishes programs, and offering jail ministries. About 1986, several LGBTQ members of the congregation and some PFLAG parents, Sherry and Jerry Garland, deeply affected in their daily lives, helped lead a study on homosexuality for members of the congregation. The pastor led the Bible study. LGBTQ church members from the first UMC in uh, Ashland helped with the study and were outspoken advocates whose leadership helped defeat anti-gay state ballot measures. In the early 1990s, a member of this church with AIDS wanted the local AIDS support group to meet at his church. People did not know enough to prevent infections or AIDS transmission through blood transfusions. Discrimination and isolation were rampant. <coughs> Judy McGarvey, a nurse and church member working with small groups, drug and alcohol treatment in the County Youth Works program, saw a need for family and client support and volunteered leadership over many years. Over against uh, objections because the request came from a respected family with a long history in the church and age support group met in the church. Over time, First United Methodist Medford has become known in the valley for its inclusion of LGBTQ people in both the life and leadership of the church. It is a Christian community where LGBT people are open-heartedly received and affirmed. And currently, the local AIDS, AIDS HIV Society, um, they have two events a year here at the church. We have more than two now. More than two? Yeah. Okay. And um, they come twice a month and pick up snacks out of our food pantry because uh, they have walk-in folks that, that come. Thank you. The headset mic is not playing nice this morning, so I'll be using the stand. Um, I am sorry I've thrown everybody off, but with my sound system going off and on, it kind of threw me off. So. But we'll, we'll bypass the um, doxology and, and move on. Um, Linda, I mean Sue, rather, <laughs> my sound has really thrown me. Um, if, uh, can we go to the gospel reading? Or to the first reading? We'll do the John Wayne first. Okay. And it is the correct one on the screen. 
John chapter 8, verses 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? You own nation, and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. We're going to um, open up your hymnals to uh, page 813, Psalm 93. I'd, I'd, I'd rather um, do this song for Christ the King Sunday. So it is Psalm 93, and Sue will lead us. Show me the fine print in the congregation will be the whole. So grab a hymnal, 813, 813, Psalm 93. We won't sing the response, this is the right one. Okay. The Lord reigns and is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed and is girded with strength. The Lord, the Lord has established his world. It shall never be needed. Your throne has been established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods are lifted up the Lord. The floods are lifted up the Lord. The floods have done it there for Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let us join in singing. To mock your way, O dearest Lord. We may remain seated.
with Lord man and to know great harm this day and some small good. Amen. So as I was saying, um, I know when you woke up this morning, you didn't think, hey, this is Sunday of Christ the King. The last Sunday of the Christian year, but I'm telling you that it is. Next week we begin Advent, and Advent begins the Christian year, waiting for the coming of Christ. So it kind of makes sense that you begin with the birth, and you end with claiming Christ as King. When I was in seminary, um, well, for some of you, well before you were a twinkle in your parents' eyes, this is like the 1980s, the whole idea of kingship in, in, in Christian thought was um, being called into question, and, and in many respects it still is. We, we, we you know, um, it seems like an old, outdated term. We're, we shouldn't be thinking about kings. To begin with, you know, kings are men, and uh, we're called, um, we, 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 we are being called away from, you know, men ruling over women. And then the whole idea of ruling back in the 80s was suspect, and, and for some, for good reason. Remember, this is a long time ago. This is the decade when the Berlin Wall was falling, and the Soviet Union was coming apart, the Cold War was coming to an end, and there was relief and celebration. Uh, there was a lot of hope at that time. If you're old enough, remember the term glasnos. Call that, right? We talked about community more in such a way that everything would become egalitarian and communal. At least that was the goal. We, we were taught, you know, in seminary, we didn't lead people, we empowered them. I've come to question that more. I think we lead and empower. That was the age of Barney. You remember Barney? You know that funny colored um, dinosaur? I love you, you love me, we are a happy family. Yeah, that was the time. That was the time. There were no more rulers, no more kings, no more lords. That was the thought. But now all these, what is it now, 40 years later? Gosh, a long time ago. Long time ago. That impulse was never squashed. Yeah. We now live in a world in which the strong man in many regions of the world has become attractive. Democracies all over are voting in leaders that lean toward autocrats. The masses are once again in many places drawn to the tough guy who will take charge and solve problems. Countries that we thought were, you know, solidly democratic, like Poland, Hungary, Turkey, and then this past week, the Netherlands have taken up, you know, turn. Vladimir Putin in the news every day. That Arab Spring, what was that, like 10 years or so ago? All that hope of reform that would take hold in the Middle East, it's been largely lost. Even countries like um, France and Germany are, 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 are battling with forces that resist a, a liberal democracy. And, and we see this in our own country, too. Our American forefathers were ruled under a king. I mean, that was the point of the revolution. And feared the presidency would become a monarch. So they created a government of checks and balances, the three branches of government, that thing you learned in social studies in middle school. Even, even the title the president was seen as somewhat pedestrian, not like a king, not like a monarch. They understood our desire for a ruler can cost us our liberties. And perhaps that's just within us, because we are creatures. We're not the creator, and we long for that, right? That creator, that king. We're finite. We are, we don't want to always admit this, but we're limited in what we can control in the world and in our lives. So we, we, we want a power that can do that for us, right? We, we feel threatened, and we ask, OK, OK, who's in charge now? Who's in charge? Who will help us save us from a fallen economy or from another pandemic, right? Who will save us when the fire burns and the hurricane sweeps through the region and, and, and leaves our lives in a heap? Who rules when the job is lost and the stock market tanks? 
Who will save us? Who's going to set things right? There's something in us that wants that king, or queen. I, I, I come to believe that that desire is just built into us. It's ingrained in the human psyche. When Saul, in the Old Testament, became king, the first king of Israel, the prophets, God, warned against it. They warned against it. They said, we are, we are different. And you're going to be taxed and enlisted for our armies. But ancient Israel wouldn't have it any other way. They wanted a king. So perhaps we're not going to make any headway against that need. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Maybe a better question is, what kind of king are we going to choose? What kind of king, what kind of power are we going to choose? And where would that power come from? And who, who is, who's going to be that king? Remember Bob Dylan? He's still around. I remember Bob Dylan. Yeah, I had troubles. Once again, for you younger people, before there was a twinkle in your eye, your parents' eye, he said to those older folks, we gotta serve, we gotta serve somebody. We're gonna serve somebody. We gotta serve somebody. It's kinda how we're made. So before we try to answer the question, that question of we can serve, it, 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 it would be helpful to understand what it, what it meant to be a king in Bible times. After all, that's where we get our language of kings and kingdoms. Thy kingdom come, right? That's where we get the language from the, the, the scripture. Kings in the Bible were sent by God or related to God. They, they were thought to have the divine imprint on them. The emperor Caesar, they held the title Son of the Divine One. Sound familiar? And that was printed on every Roman coin. And that was the controversy when the early church claimed that Jesus held the title Son of God because he was competing with, well, with the emperor. And like fighters at a rape, there can only be one champ. So it set the early church in a long history, a long course of persecution. Which, which, that's the reason for the book of Revelation. It's written, you know, to the church to remind the faithful that King Jesus was in charge. Despite the oppressive political system surrounding them, despite the persecution, Jesus was in charge. So saying someone was king was also saying that God put them in that position. Something we still see government when people really want their way they try to get the back of government. It's decreed this way. Kings and queens are divinely installed. Which is why even to this day in the United Kingdom, King Charles is the head of the church, yet he rarely attends, right? It's a seat given by God. In today's lesson from the Gospel of John, and I really encourage you to go home and read it again. Jesus is on trial before the Jews and Rome. Jesus has been brought to Pilate's headquarters, right? Pilate is a representative of Rome, and he's the appointed governor to that region. And his job is to represent the empire, collect revenue, three things, represent the empire, collect revenue, and keep the peace among the people who have a long history of rebellion, especially when they have been occupied. And he asked Jesus in this passage, so, and I can imagine him asking in kind of an offhand way, are you the king of the Jews, really? Are you the king of the Jews? Inevitably, um, Jesus does answer, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. To clarify, to clarify Jesus is not saying that his kingdom is unrelated to the world. That's important. He's not saying anything about vocation. To say that Jesus was not king of this world would go against everything we know about Jesus. You know, he came to release captives of Israel. 
He came to defeat the evil powers of this world. He came to heal the blind, the lame, the sick, and feed the hungry, which is all stuff of this world. John's Gospel states he loved the whole world. What it's saying when he says he's not of this world? He's saying that his kingdom doesn't originate from this world. He doesn't get validation by this world to be king. He's not voted to be king. Or he's not given it to by the people. He wasn't enthroned by the Jews to be their king. And of course he's not enthroned by Rome, definitely. Which is to say, and this is important, we don't make Jesus king. That's out of our control. He is enthroned to be king by the heavenly father. It's up to us just to acknowledge that Jesus is king. Recall, recall how the Gospel of John begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus was the Word become flesh. He's there from the beginning, creating and ruling, has nothing to do with whether or not we put him there. In the Garden of Gethsemane in the Gospel of John, before the trial, when the soldiers come to arrest him, his captors would read, fall backward. They actually fall to the ground. And it's a way for John to say, the soldiers are able to arrest Jesus because Jesus allows them to. Jesus gives himself to them. Jesus' trial isn't a really a trial about Jesus. It's a trial about Pilate. And Pilate, when we read the Gospel, kind of knows this. It's really a trial about the Rome, about Rome and the Jews, and all who would deny an innocent victim and put him on a cross. That King Jesus, that Jesus is king, isn't the debate. The debate is whether or not we will receive Jesus as king. And that's where the judgment comes. Would we receive, would we receive him as one of love? Some years ago, I served a congregation that had a sister relationship with an African Methodist Episcopal Church. And we, we had a good relationship. We held Holy Week services together. We did vacation Bible school together. I, I helped them with their revival. They came from our special events. It was a good thing. And my relationship with the pastor became close and ongoing. The Jonesville African Methodist Church was just across the street, not from my church, but from the neighborhood that I lived in. And my family, bless my kids' hearts, we were always the last ones to leave the church because their father was the preacher. And as we were driving down the road and about to turn into our neighborhood, we could see the AME church that they were still in session. And I would say to my kids, it could be worse. Look at it, they're still there. <laughs> All of them, they're not getting home till three. <laughs> they were still there, there were cars in the parking lot, and they were preaching and praying and singing. And I said to that black pastor, that friend, you know, if I go past an hour in my white church, my people are holding up the watches and pointing <laughs> to the time, you're done. This is what he said. He laughed and he said, well, when you're getting beaten down all week, it takes more time to be reminded of who's in charge. And that's what being King Jesus is about. His people lived hard lives. They were mostly low-income folks who had been displaced, displaced by this wealthy suburban neighborhood where I live and then had to move to the inner city where the rent was cheap. And then on Sundays, they came back to that part of town where they still had that one piece of property left and they worshiped where they had been worshiping for generations. And to remind me of who was in charge. Remember the psalm that we read together. The Lord is king, let the earth rejoice. And that's what they did. And that's really what that trial was about. Jesus wasn't on trial. The people were on trial. 
during the trial, Jesus says to Pilate, if my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Which is a way of saying, if your kingship is from this world, the only way to keep your title is with armies and conquest. And I don't have to do that. You have to fight to hold on to your kingship. You've got you to gotta manipulate. You've got you to gotta hold on to your territory in whatever way you can. And Jesus is saying, I don't have to do that. I mean, we, 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 we got some violent people in charge right now in this world. Violent, crazy, just dark people. I mean, regardless of where you stand, I mean, it's just, we do. we got some more to go. But remember this. Earthly kings and queens die. They do. Their days are numbered. They're limited. Now, in, in the past, for those kings and queens, those rulers, some of their deaths are more well-known than others. But they all die. They're as frail as any of us. On the 15th of March, the Ides of March, Julius Caesar is stabbed to death on his way to the Senate. The seer warns him of his coming doom. Caesar thinks of himself as impenetrable, as folks sometimes do. The Ides of March are come, he says. As I look, I'm still alive. Before the day is over, he is assassinated. Just for the fun, I found online a list of the British monarchs and their cause of death. I know that kind of sounds morbid, but um, that's what I did this past week, right? <laughs> and it reads like a bad night in the emergency room. <laughs> yeah, man, oh man, these powerful people. They had ugly ways of going. William King Rufus, first mistake was his name, William King Rufus was shot in the chest by a hunting companion, to get this, at which time his brother, who was also hunting, runs to Winchester in the royal treasury and takes the throne. That kind of sounds suspicious, right? <laughs> who made him king? Right? Isn't that how it works? And there are so many others that went gruesomely and suddenly. And I'm going to just stick with the Henrys because I don't know. The Henry sounded most interesting. <laughs> Henry the first dies of food poisoning. Henry the third dies of syphilis. Henry the fourth dies of leprosy. Henry the fifth dies of dysentery. Henry the seventh dies of turkey, turkey, tuberculosis. Henry the eighth dies of obesity and probably diabetes. Well, he had some other problems too. <laughs> Henry the second is the only one who dies of natural causes, but he only lived to be 35. Henry the sixth went missing. Yeah, but isn't that how it is? Who's king? Mm -hmm. Who's king? Yeah, who's king? So when Pilate asks Jesus, so are you a king? Jesus answers, my kingdom isn't from this world. He's saying, nations don't make me king. Earlier in the Gospel, John says, I am the resurrection and the life. We just say, I will be crucified, a gruesome death, but I'll rise again. We don't make him king. We don't have that power. We just proclaim it. Neither can we take him down from his throne and destroy him. Jesus is <coughs> He has the imprint of the Heavenly Father on him. He rules. And that is relief to us. Because unlike any other king or ruler, and now I quote from the Bible, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him out of love. Our only saving response is to take him into our hearts and put our trust in him. Our king loves us. Our king is willing to die for us. 
Our king has seen the worst of us. And yet he rules with love. We, we do the best to make something of our lives, don't we? And if you've got children or grandchildren, we do the best that they can make something of their lives, too. But in the end, we can't control fate. We don't number our days. We don't control the droughts, the winds, the fire, the temperature. We don't control how the economy will turn the next season. We can control whether there'll be another pandemic in two, three years. We have a king that gave his life. That is an astounding statement, because all of those other kings, they would never have done that. Never. We can put our lives under his rule and sleep at night. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up. This means that even in the chaotic waters, obey him. He calms the sea. The Lord King is robed in majesty. He is Lord and girded with strength. And that's good news. In the book of Revelation, John, who is ex John of Apotmos, who is exiled, opens his letter with this statement. Listen to this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and is to come. Pay attention to that order of time in that phrase. I am the beginning and the end, who is, who is and was and is to come. I am the king who is. The present is stated first, because that's where we're living and struggling. The natural order of time has changed. Now is emphasized, because now Jesus is king. And despite how the world treats you, despite what you fear, despite the difficulties, despite what keeps you up at night, you are my priesthood, a kingdom. Given responsibility and possession, you are under my dominion forever ever. I am your ruler, and I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus is king. Amen.
just for coffee, tea, and some snacks, all right, after worship, and know that Father watches over us, King Jesus walks beside us, the Holy Spirit is within us. Let's say amen. Amen. Thank you.